Again, let me remind you to feel free to get up anytime during the time that uh, we're talking together and thinking out loud together. And I do need more of your participation in this session than in the previous one. So I want you to feel uh, comfortable about uh, expressing yourself and offering any uh, insight or perspective that, uh, that you have. I mentioned to you on uh, more than one occasion that I didn't know what people were going through with their life after their loss. I knew that they had suffered heartbreaking loss. What I didn't know about was what it was like every day and every night after their loss. But then I began to experience things that I'd never experienced before. And one of the things that I chose to do is become as connected as I could with as many people as I could who was trying to navigate their life after their loss. And I found that very helpful. I'm going to actually share with you, in their own words, in many cases, what some of these people are going through who are trying to live a life after the loss of their spouse. David Klaus was a deacon in the Lord's Church in Northeast Ohio. He lost his wife, Joyce. She was a church secretary in Maslin, Ohio. And after she passed away, and several months afterwards, I got in contact with David and he sent me this email. He said, I had a difficult day today. I just came home from vac vacation to an empty house. Then I went to a wedding. The girl that was being married that day was a favorite of my wife's when my wife had her as a student in Bible classes and listening to the vows being exchanged really got to me. I had a long talk with a friend last week about how it's so odd being the odd person out when you're going out to eat or doing things publicly. Like today, for instance, going to a wedding and a reception. Sometimes my life just is not enjoyable. For me, it's difficult being alone after having a companion for so long. In my younger days, I lived with my parents until the day that we were married. And then Joyce died. And I've never been alone until now. One brother in Middle Tennessee shared this with me. August 16th of 2021, my heart was shattered as my sweet wife, Carolyn, went home to be with the Lord. Now I live alone in a time I do not understand. It is a lonely world of darkness that I just don't fit in anymore. I have no one to care for but myself. The one I devoted myself to is gone. He said later in this, uh, what he shared with me, he said, frankly, that day my life stopped. This is not the way we planned it. My whole life was gone. She was not supposed to die before me. We held hands together constantly for 55 years. We thoroughly discussed everything that we did. She laid out my clothes every morning so that we would match every day. I eat out very little. Sunday was our day out. Someone at church will ask me to join them and I accept once in a while. I always go when a church has an eating event. But who do I sit with? If I sit with a family, their conversation does not allow me to join in. Because I really don't fit in. One brother, retired preacher in Cookville, Tennessee, shared this with me. A real marriage is about sharing. And the widow or widower no longer has someone to unload their life with. Children are great. Friends are fine. But never the same as what it was like when we're sharing our life with our mate. Dear Janice, wish you were here, but glad you are there. 
One lady shared this with me. I'm sitting here crying my eyes out. I really thought that I was beyond questioning and beyond the intense pain. I feel like a knife has been thrust through my heart. One widow lady I know said this to me. Sometimes I feel like I've got to get out of this house. And then when I get out of the house, all I want to do is go back home again. One brother shared this with me. I don't know what's going on. I just can't stop crying this afternoon. I'm just so lonesome. But when people are around, I just want them to leave so I can cry. One brother who was the recovery minister at the University City Church in Gainesville, Florida, Ron McQuinn, he was a guy who academically was trained in clinical psychology. His wife got dementia in her 50s. It was a genetic form of dementia that caused her to decline really, really quickly. He mentions this to me. I was her primary caregiver for three and a half years while she was sick. I was grieving the loss of my wife to a disease. The grieving that I did after Kathy's death was different than the grieving I did before she died. This was despite all of my professional training. It surprised me. For those three and a half years, I was so consumed by the day-to-day -day responsibilities of her care while she lived, along with a deep sense of the things lost as she slipped away, I forgot how to deal with the now and the future. I am living proof that a person can intellectually know the processes commonly associated with death and loss and yet be prepared, unprepared for the experience itself. Kathy is a lady I met who lost her husband in her 50s. She lives in Titusville, Florida. And Kathy shared this with me in a text and then permitted me to share this publicly. I was told by a family member that loves me Time will heal. I don't think that is at all possible. 33 years of my life with my husband, sharing three children together, was my whole world. I just can't see past today, and the pain is too much. Kim Knight wrote a book called The Widow's Might, and in that book she said, The space inside of me, previously occupied by that passionate relationship, was strangely empty. I went from having someone think I was the most amazing person on earth to feeling invisible and vacant. One lady said, after 10 years of being a widow, in many ways I've gotten used to taking this ride alone. It's the little things that I know I will never get used to. Having to empty the dishwasher, no one to share a good night kiss with or to take in my arms. I'm still reminded daily that I miss Lane. I will never get used to the loneliness that I feel. There's a book called Getting to the Other Side of Grief. It was written by a man and a woman. A man who had a background in pastoral counseling. The woman had a background in nursing. And it was the woman who said this in that book. I wanted to kill myself. Going to bed at night was so hard, I prayed that God would let me die. I wanted out of this life. That's just a little smackling of some of the many, many things that I've learned with other people sharing with me about their struggle. I never knew. I figure probably most of you didn't know people struggled like that either. The vast majority of what I shared with you came from brothers and sisters in the Lord. People of faith. See, just because you're a Christian that doesn't mean you're not going to struggle when you suffer great loss in your life. That you're not going to be impacted 
by that experience of loss. It is a mighty struggle to lose somebody that you've loved dearly. No offense to any widowed person who is here, but Millie, I think, will always be my favorite widow. I was preaching in a gospel meeting at the Grossback Church of Christ on the north side of Cincinnati, and the preacher, Mark Phillips, he came to me and he said, Dean, I've got this 90-plus-year-old lady who wants to take you out to lunch. Now, after being married for 41 years and having three daughters, I knew it's not a very safe thing, unless from a distance, for a man to tell a woman no, especially if she's 90-plus years old. And I said, Mark, just arrange it whenever it's fine. So Millie took me out to a Japanese restaurant, which I thought was weird. I didn't know 90-plus-year-old women ate at Japanese restaurants. But Millie took me out to this Japanese restaurant. The waiter came up, and then we ordered. And the waiter left, and I did what I like to do with widowed people. When it's timely and the surroundings are appropriate, I turned to Millie and I said, Millie, tell me your story. Tell me your story of love and loss. She said, well, I was married for 63 years. She told me about this guy that she had met, and she told me about their life together. She told me about what a great father he was. She talked about him getting cancer. She talked about her being the caregiver for him, and then about him dying after 63 years of marriage. And then she drops this conversational bomb. She says, but that wasn't my first husband. I said, Millie, tell me about your first husband. Well, Ray Farmer was his name. She said, I was 19 years old. We already had one child about a year old, and I was pregnant with our second child. And she said, Ray was in General Patton's army in the Battle of the Bulge. And that's where he died. I could quote exactly what she said after that. Quote, and I had him buried in France. A decision that to this day, I regret. I thought a lot about that conversation. After that day at that Japanese restaurant. And I thought, how did Millie navigate her life after that loss? At 19 years old, being pregnant, already having one child about a year old. This is in the mid-1940s. And her husband dies in General Patton's army. How in the world did that kid navigate that loss? Some way, somehow she did that for about four years. And that's when she married this other guy that she was married to for 63 years. After hearing that story, and I would do workshops after that, I would sometimes call her and I would say, Millie, I told your story. I wanted her to know that her life, her life, love, and law story had inspirational value. If Millie Hartman at age 19, could navigate loss in the mid-1940s, I thought I can do that too. And everybody else can do that too. But we just can't give up. You know, sometimes when we have lost somebody really dear to us, you know what we feel? We feel dead. You know what we may want to do? We may want to die. But you know what we've really got to be determined not to do? We've got to be determined not to die because somebody else died. One of the three mottos of the Widowhood Workshop Ministry is, Don't die until you're dead. You may feel dead. You may want to die. But you're not dead. And we've got to learn to navigate our life after our loss. But it's a very difficult thing to do. Especially when it's a spouse. The risk factors when it comes to being widowed are pretty simple. You get married, you stay married, and you keep living. And tag, you're it. You're the one. In the wedding ceremony, twice we hear that phrase, until death do us part. 
But when do we ever talk about that? Or do we really prepare for that end after that ceremony? Every widowed person first was a married person. Now I'd like for us to open this up for discussion now. And I'd like to ask you for things that in our culture we commonly associate with being widowed. Now, we're trying to be educational here. Some of us will think of things that others won't. But give me some things that we commonly associate with widowhood in our culture today. Go. Loneliness is almost always the very first thing that's mentioned. Why? Well, if you've poured your heart and soul into that marriage, and you've lived with that person, and you've come to love them dearly, and that person's no longer there, that is, that is a harsh reality to deal with. I'm sure if I were to say the name Kathy Lee Gifford, you would remember her from the Today Show. She was married to Frank Gifford. Frank Gifford was a great football player for the New York Giants, a halfback for the New York Giants. They married uh, and were married for 29 years. He was significantly older than she was. And he died. AARP Magazine. Now I know you're probably thinking, why would Dean be reading AARP Magazine? <laughs> I just happened to pick one up one day, okay? <laughs> And I saw this article that was written about Kathy Lee Gifford in an interview with her. He passed away in 2015. You know what she said about her loneliness? I wrote this down because I thought this was really powerful. Quote, crippling loneliness. That's what she had. Crippling loneliness. The Tennessean... The newspaper in Nashville, Tennessee, did an interview with her and printed an article about her. See, she lived up there in the New York City area. She moved to Franklin, Tennessee, Williamson County, Tennessee, in Middle Tennessee. And here's the explanation she gave for that move. Quote, I moved here because I was dying of loneliness. That's loneliness on steroids. I was dying of loneliness. Yeah, it's hard. It's really hard. The loneliness. I called Alfred. We had a local widowhood ministry in Murray City, Tennessee, about 30 minutes north of Jackson, Tennessee. We had developed a local widowhood ministry there, and every month there were three or four of us widowed people who prepared a great meal, a feast, and we invited widowed people from all over West Tennessee to come once a month to this widowhood fellowship. About half of the attendees were not members of the church, by the way. And I heard about Alfred Bushart losing his wife. I'd never met this man. He was in his early 80s, I was told. I called him on the phone. Now this is a guy, not a female. This is a guy in his early 80s. Guys are not real transparent about things that are personal in their life. And this is in a phone conversation. When I invited him to come to the Widowhood Fellowship that month, you know what he said about his loneliness? He said he was painfully lonely. Widowed people live in a coupled world. Now, I'm thinking if you've been living a coupled life, for a few years, you've become very accustomed to a coupled life. Let me prove to you that we live in a coupled world. I'll share with you a couple of anecdotes. At the Freed Artiman University lectureship this past February, I was walking up to a vendor space. And it was a vendor space that was hosted by the Freed Artiman Associates, women who sell things to raise money for the school. And as I approached that vendor space, where for previous years, for many years when I would come to the lectureship, I would buy something from that table and take home to my wife. And as I approached the table this past February, the lady said, 
Before the lectureship is over, make sure you buy something to take home to your wife. My immediate internal reaction was, should I say something or not? I decided to say something, but in a real careful tone, just to provide her education about how we shouldn't assume that everybody who's an adult is coupled. A similar thing happened to me at an airport in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was out there and happened to be out there with a female friend of mine. As a matter of fact, she lives in Dallas, Texas now. We graduated from the same high school in New Philadelphia, Ohio. And we had gone together to this particular workshop and she was helping me with this particular workshop and we were fixing to fly out of Albuquerque to Dallas. I usually carry uh, two pieces of luggage, both of them have 50 pounds in it. Well, one had about 51 and one had 49, so I needed to open up one of my pieces of luggage and put something in this other piece of luggage. So the guy at the Southwest counter said, here, uh, as I was taking things out, give me that and I'll pass it on and give it to your wife. My female friend was standing to my right. The assumption was we were husband and wife. We live in a coupled world. The fact is, there are people in the world who are adults who have experienced the agony of divorce and they're no longer married. They're living in a coupled world too. Then there are those of us who have lost our spouse and lost our marriage because of death. And we live in a coupled world too. There are also adults who have never married. There are about a half a million of them in our country. And they live in a coupled world. Do you know what it's like to live in a coupled world and not be a part of a couple? The best way I can suggest to you to think about it is to go to an animated show on TV that you probably see every year. The Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer animated story. There was an island where these toys live. Do you remember the name of the island? The Island of Misfit Toys. People who are flying solo in a coupled world are social misfits. That's a really hard thing to get used to. It's extremely uncomfortable, especially early on, in a coupled world to not be coupled and be out in public. There are two places that are really hard for widowed people to go. I mean really, really hard for widowed people to go. One is to bed. Because it's an in-your-face reminder, the fact that you're not a part of a couple anymore. Do you know where the other person, or the other place is that a person's going to struggle? A restaurant. A lot of women, widowed women, will not go to a restaurant. Not by themselves they won't. Coming to church. Coming to church can be a place where a lot of salty tears fall down the cheeks of widowed people. When you've done something like that for decades with another person, for years with another person, and now you have to do it alone, do you sit in the same place where you and your... I assume this church is like most churches. You've got to sign seating too. Okay? <laughs> I know that if I sit on the front pew, I'm not going to be sitting in somebody's seat because people don't have assigned seating on the front pew. I, I laugh about that. With the Murray City, Tennessee Church, one thing I used to kid them about, they not only had assigned seating, they had assigned parking. I mean, I knew where they parked and where they sat when they went into the church building. And sitting in church by yourself, after sitting in church with your spouse, that is a really difficult challenge. I met this couple in Mission, Texas, way down on that tip of Texas. This young couple, they were graduates of Harding University. They told me while I was doing a workshop there about this ministry they have where every Sunday morning they come in and they target somebody. They target a widowed person. And they go to that widowed person and they say, May we sit with you this morning in church? 
Isn't that a neat ministry? How thoughtful. Women people at church, who do they sit with? We need to make it a point to make sure they don't sit by themselves. It can be a very, very difficult challenge. You know what I really hate about coming to church? What I really miss about being in worship in the public assembly? Is not having my wife there to hold hands with when we pray in the corporate assembly. I really miss that. Not to have somebody to put your arm around. I miss that. It's a very difficult adjustment. Give me something else that you would associate with widowhood. Insecurity. insecurity. Why would there be insecurity? Fear of the unknown. And what do you not know? You're clueless about a lot of things, aren't you? Because you had, a, you were part of a team, you were part of a couple, and you worked together with other people, your spouse, and maybe with your families. But now, you've got to deal with things alone. You don't have anybody anymore to be your sounding board, to talk about decisions. Now, a lot of that's just dumped on you. So there can be a lot of securities, insecurities, a lot of fears, a lot of worries. What else might you associate with widowhood? Uh, financial problems. Financial jeopardy is not uncommon with the widowed. Now I know that we think in our culture we've created the perfect environment because we have this social network. It's called social security. Well, if you think that social security is the solution to the problems of the widowed financially, you're either naive or ignorant or both, because it's not. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Census Bureau has done some studies about this. Elderly women, now I'm not about to put a number on what that means. And I haven't seen them put a number on that. But they just said elderly women in this study I read. Elderly women who are widowed are three to four times more likely to live in poverty than elderly women who are married. They're three to four times more likely to live in poverty. There can be a lot of financial jeopardy involved in being widowed. There could be a great loss of revenue stream. How about something else that you would? Yes, ma'am. I'm taking care of my wife. I've got it all under control. And she didn't even know the password to get into the computer. And if she doesn't know the password even to get into the computer where all that information is stored, what is she going to do? Let me tell you about Danny. Yeah. 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 Both people need to know about a lot of things together. Danny Vaughn lost, her, lost his wife, Margaret, and the way they distributed their um, assignments in their marriage was he took care of everything outside the house, she took care of everything inside the house. So she did all the cleaning, all the cooking, she also took care of all the finances, insurance, taxes, and all that. She up and dies on him. He's clueless about all that stuff. You know how hard up he was for help when it came to cooking? He called the preacher. He called me for recipes. Because he knew I loved to cook. As a matter of fact, let me tell you about... Now, Daniel, I hope this never happens to you. Let me tell you about the greatest compliment that I've ever been paid as a local preacher. When I left Murray City, Tennessee, I spent five years there with them. They were a broken church because they were no longer the church they used to be. And I was a broken preacher because I had lost my wife. So we were a great match. We worked together for five years. The last day I was their local preacher on March 1 of 2020, I had two women come to me independently and say the same thing. They said, Dean, you're the best preacher's wife we've ever had at this church. 
They love my cooking. And I worked together with those widows, and we provided these great feasts every month for widows who would come from sometimes four or five different counties in West Tennessee. Well, you know, we need to know about things. We need to know about financial things. We need to know about things in regard to the house. There needs to be a sharing of that information because one of the two is going to be left behind. Can you think of something else that you would relate to widowhood? Yes, ma'am. Young widows with children. What are they going to do? I, I may take a couple of minutes tomorrow, if the Lord permits, tomorrow uh, evening, and share with you some faces of some young widows. Two days ago was Brian's birthday. Brian passed away. Brian and his family, the Stewart family, lived in Grosbeck, Texas. Shauna is the young lady who has left behind with her two daughters age 15 and 12. She took the day off when it was her birthday. And as she drove to Waco, Texas, she was crying. Her two daughters have Crohn's disease. Two daughters that have Crohn's disease. And she's a young widow. And the kids are 15 and 12. That's a hard life. That's a very challenging life. The life of a widow or a widower who has children at home is a special, unique challenge. Let me tell you something that uh, I don't publicize and I don't think ever will publicize. But I will share this story with you since that subject got brought up. One of the things that my family wants to do with my family's passion project, the Widowhood Workshop Ministry, is every year we pick out at least one widowed person who has children still at home, and we treat them to a make-a-wish kind of experience. And we put the bill for everything. Because we have a special place in our heart for widows who are dealing not just with the loss of their spouse, but with the responsibilities of still having children at home, you'd be surprised how many of those people there are in the Lord's church and I'm sure in our communities. How about something else that you might relate to widowhood? Let me share with you several. Whenever we lose somebody, we think about grieving. But can you imagine somebody losing their spouse and feeling relief? Instead of grief? Give me a scenario where that might happen. Okay, if the spouse has suffered, and especially if they're a faithful child of God and they pass away, well, you feel a relief at least that they're not suffering anymore. Okay? Can you think of any other scenario? What if there had been an abusive relationship? Sometimes bad marriages end with somebody dying. And if there's an abusive relationship, there's no longer the need to fear that abuse except for what's internal because of that abuse that you're going to have to deal with for the rest of your life. That's something that you're going to have to deal with the rest of your life. Now, if you've lost your spouse and you feel more relief than you do grief, how's that going to make you feel? You're guilty. What do you have to be guilty about? Nothing. But that doesn't mean you're not going to be internally conflicted. Well, whenever we're thinking about grieving, we often think about tears. Now, let me confess to you, I'm not a normal man. Now, how could I be normal if I had a wife for 41 years and I had three daughters? If a man grows up with overexposure to the female gender, you can't turn out normal, okay? So I admit I'm not a normal man. I can tear up really quickly. There are things that just can really cause me to tear up real quickly. I also love Hallmark movies. Now, I had to beg off of them for two or three years, but now I have no problem watching them 
and I love to watch them because I love love. And I love to watch people who are in love. Well, what if uh, your spouse dies and you're crying tears and tears and tears and you can't stop yourself from crying? What do, you, what do you say whenever you tear up or you start crying in the presence of somebody else? What do you say? I'm sorry. What do you have to be sorry for? Absolutely nothing. One of the books up here on the table is one of the first books I read about grief that I thought was really great. Douglas Manning wrote a book called Don't Take My Grief Away. And that spirit and that perspective is really, I think, very valuable to people who suffer great loss in their life. Don't let anybody take your grief away because your grieving is your grieving. Nobody has any business telling you how long you should grieve or how you should grieve. Don't let anybody take your grief away. Don't let a child of yours do it. Don't let a parent do it. Don't let a brother or sister in the Lord, a preacher, a shepherd in the Lord's church, don't let anybody take your grief away. You go ahead and you cry at church, when you're out shopping, when you're behind the wheel of your car. You cry anytime you want to and you feel a need to. God gave you the ability to cry for a reason. It's very therapeutic. Maybe you've even heard somebody say about, man, I had a really good cry. It can be very therapeutic. As a matter of fact, crying in the presence of somebody else communicates to them about what it's like after loss. You know, they may not remember words that we say, but they remember visions where they've seen us cry to a degree that we can't stop crying. Now, what about if you suffer great loss and you can't cry? You're not crying. How's that going to make you feel? You're guilty again. Internally conflicted. Do you know some people physiologically, they can't cry? We need to realize whatever your reaction is after grief, that's your reaction. It may not be somebody else's reaction. It may not be traditional or typical, but it's your reaction, and it's okay. You're going to experience a heartache like you've never experienced before, and you're going to have questions that are going to pop into your brain that you'd never thought about before, and some of those questions may have to do with God, with the church, with religion. I love the story in Mark 9 of the man who brought that terribly afflicted boy to Jesus, flailing away, foaming at the mouth, sometimes being tossed in the water or the fire. He comes to Jesus and says, Lord, I believe. And then what's he turn around and say? Help my unbelief. We should not be ashamed if we struggle with our faith. As a matter of fact, that struggle with your faith could be the best blessing you ever receive in your life. Because that struggle may result in a greater faith. It's like having doubts. You know, having doubts is not in itself a bad thing. It's how we respond to those doubts, how we address those doubts. That's really what matters. And sometimes having a faith struggle can cause us to be a stronger person than we've ever been before because we have struggled with our faith. If you're struggling with your faith because of your life circumstance, especially if it's a great loss, that's the reason we have shepherds in the Lord's church. That's why we emphasize in the Lord's church ministering to one another. But we need to be honest about the struggles we're having so that we can benefit from the ministry of other people. The loneliness is unparalleled in our life. And we may have an identity crisis because if you were a part of a couple for years and years in your life, but the couple no longer exists, what are you? There is an identity crisis. I said this last night. I want to say it again. Your marital status is not your identity. Your marital status is a part of your life story. It's not your identity. Whether it's being single, having gone through a divorce, being widowed, being married, those are just a part of your life story. They are not 
your identity. Your identity is your connection, your relationship with God. But you may struggle because you've permitted your marital status to become a part of your identity. There may be financial jeopardy involved in your situation. You're having to deal with forced change and you're having to deal with the absence of that person. Whenever you look at where they sat, what do you see? What do you see? Empty. You see air. They're not there. You have to deal with the absence of that person. And that is a hard thing to get used to. Last night when we were talking about change, whether it's chosen change or forced change, we've got to realize that that new beginning involves a journey through a forest that's very difficult, where you're going to struggle with a lot of things, and you're not going to be normal, you're not going to be yourself, and you're going to have a struggle for who knows how long before you get to a new beginning in your life. We've got to be patient with ourselves and patient with others when we're walking through that very difficult time in our life. There's a lot of things like dreams that I never thought about before. It's not an uncommon thing for a person who's lost their spouse to have dreams about that spouse over a decade later. That's not uncommon at all. Do you know how much struggle you have sometimes controlling your mind when you're awake? Okay, can we admit that? Now, when you go to sleep, who has control over your mind? Your mind's going to do whatever it wants to. It's going to go wherever it wants to. There's not, you're not, you're not problematic. And that's not a bad sign if you have dreams about the person that you've lost for years and years afterwards. It's not a problem. Don't let it be. You're going to have to deal with the silence where there used to be sounds. Do you know what most widowed people do first thing in the morning when they get up? Turn on the TV. They make some noise. Because that silence can be deafening. You've become accustomed to that other person in your life rattling those pots and pans. Reading the Bible out loud. Playing music on a CD player. You're going to have to deal with the emptiness that you have inside of you. And you have to recognize the fact that you now have a dependence you didn't have before. Many of us were raised by parents who challenged us to become independent. And independence is a good thing, unless it's independence to a fault. God loves us, and God wants us to love others. You know how you feel whenever, because God loves you, you love other people, and you minister to other people? How does that make you feel? It makes you feel... Good. People sometimes want to minister to us. If we say, no, 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 I can take care of that myself. And we prohibit them from showing God's love to us. How does that make them feel? See, we need to let people minister to us. Just like we have been blessed by ministering to others, we need to permit other people to minister to us. It's good to be independent. It's not good to be independent to a fault. We need to permit other people to love us just like we need to love other people. The stress level is incredible and it's not uncommon to have anger. So you've lost your spouse and you're angry. Who are you angry at? And there's more than one answer. Go. Your spouse? Your spouse has died and you're mad at your spouse. Why in the world would you be mad at your spouse? Because they left you. And there was a lady in Florida who honestly shared with me that after her husband died, when she would take a shower, there were times that she would beat the side of the shower wall and she would say, why did you leave me? Why did you leave me? Was she crazy? Nope. She was grieving. And she was angry at her husband. That may sound crazy. But it's not crazy. It's just grief is what it is. See, sometimes we misinterpret grief as crazy. It may seem crazy, but it's good grieving. Who else might you be angry with? Who? God. God? You're going to be angry at God. Why are you going to be angry at God? 
What has God done? He took the person away. He sent angels to come and take your mate away. You know, sometimes people blame God. As if God had a direct hand and it was what he desired. How would you know that? What verse in the Bible has your name on it? That has to do with that specific situation. How would you know that? I'm not talking about your feelings. I'm talking about your knowing. How would you know that? At the very least, God permitted it to happen. I can say that. I said last night, God permitted my wife to get Parkinson's disease. God permitted her to decline for eight and a half years. God permitted her to die on Christmas morning. God permitted all that. I'm not about to suggest that God wanted that. He desired that, but he did permit that. And there are some things after loss that we might wonder about in regard to God. You know, if you're angry, if you're a little kid and you're angry at your parents, now let's put yourself in the place of the parent. How would you want the kid to act? Would you want, if, if you have a kid that's angry at you, would you want them to bottle all that up? Or would you rather have them come to you and just blow up? Would it, which would be better for your relationship? Yeah, come to me. If you're angry with God, who should you go to? To God. You know, you can only put so much air in a balloon to where it's going to pop. If we stop our anger, what's going to happen is, at some point in time, it's going to set us off and we're going to pop. It's normal to be angry with God. It's normal human. I didn't say it was the appropriate, best response, wisest response, but it's very human to be angry with God. And sometimes we have a lot of theological struggle. You know, our view of God can be dramatically affected by the circumstances in our life. We need to work that out in our relationship with God. There's also worry and fear about a lot of things. You had somebody else to go through life with, but now you don't have that person anymore. And it's scary having to be the sole person to make all the decisions and do all the things. And there's restlessness, tossing and turning because things are not like they used to be. I was in Chester, West Virginia. This was after Brother Frank Hickenbotham passed away. And I was helping the church there a little bit with that difficult struggle. They've had the same preacher for over 50 years. And I went over and helped them a little bit. They permitted me to do the first pitiful excuse for a workshop. And I did something like this with them. And after that session, there was this older gentleman, probably early 80s, ball-headed guy. Water was beginning to collect in his eyes. And he said, hey, I've got a, something I want you to add to that list. This is when the list was much long, much shorter than this list. He said, I've got something I want to suggest to you that you add to that list. And I want to share with you what that was. It was suicidal thoughts. Now we're naive if we think that in our assemblies on Sunday morning, with everybody gathered together, that we haven't gotten somebody or some people in that group who in the recent past hasn't had suicidal thoughts because of something that they're experiencing in their life. See, life and the experiences we have can have a dramatic impact on us and can cause us to go places that we never have gone before inside of us. And suicidal thoughts are much more common than we'd like to admit. That's why we need to cultivate this culture of transparency where we're willing to talk more about the struggles that we're having in our life. All of this, why is it so hard? Why is this so difficult to lose a spouse? Well, when you stop and think about it, what other human relationship in the Bible is described in the unique way marriage is? Those two words, one flesh. It's the only human relationship described like that 
in the Bible. There are 8.5, 8.7 maybe even, billion people on planet Earth. How many people are in your marriage? There's only two. Man, if that doesn't impress you with how special your marriage is, what in the world would? You're the only two people on planet Earth in that relationship. And it's the only relationship God describes as a one flesh relationship. And when you stop and think about what life is really like when you're married, the way it ought to be, here's the way it is. Here's a prescription for a magnificent marriage. It's all about the total giving of the total self for a total lifetime. You take two flawed people, no matter how flawed they are, if they both buy into this philosophy, they will have a magnificent marriage. They're not going to have a perfect marriage because you can't take two imperfect people and create something perfect, but you can take two flawed people and you can create something magnificent. If they both buy into the total giving of the total self for a total lifetime. Now, if you've done that, and you've lost that. What are you going to be like? You're going to struggle mightily. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how much faith you have. You are going to struggle with that because you have a problem. You're human. See, you're not a robot. You know, you're not a laptop. You're not an engine in a car. You're not a machine. You're a human. And human beings have thinkers and feelers. And when we have ourselves experiencing things in life that are extremely difficult, we are going to struggle mightily in our life, and it's okay to admit to other people that we are not okay. When will we ever get to the point where we're willing to admit that we're not okay? I don't remember the exact congregation it was. It was somewhere north of Dallas where I was visiting with this church on a Sunday evening and it was a smallish group that was there and he was finishing his sermon and he broke down emotionally he just broke down he cracked and then he started talking very personally about what a mess he was I felt so sorry for that man nobody in that congregation went up to him and I really was thinking about should I get up and and come up and be with him physically. Finally, there was a man, a younger man in that group that came up to him to stand by his side. But then he talked about what a struggle he was going through right then in his life. The preacher. Imagine that, the preacher being a mess. See, if we could cultivate that kind of a culture, we'd all be a whole lot better at helping one another through the difficult things that we struggle with in our life. Widowhood is unique, though, that's why we should never say, I know how you feel to a widowed person. There are a lot of things that make widowhood unique. We are individuals, and individuals are different. Relationships are different. Families are different. Some families are highly dysfunctional. Some families are very open and very much tight, good and healthy. Some marriages, people have been married a lot longer than other people. Losing a spouse 63 years... Losing a spouse a little over 1,300 days, that's a totally different situation. And then you've got the fact that our experiences are different through all the time that we're together. And whether or not we have faith, that's all going to have an effect on us and how we react. I'm going to ask somebody to come up here and distribute some... Uh, some forks. I found them. Okay, these forks, I don't want to go to everybody. Raise your hand if you are presently widowed. If you're presently widowed, I want to give you this gift. It's, it's a fork. Now, if you want to lose weight, use it to eat with. <clears throat> okay, but it's not the reason I'm giving you the fork. It's not for you to eat with it. Raise your hand if you're widowed. Let me make sure that everybody who's widowed Make sure that you don't leave without getting a fork. Up here in front there's somebody. After you've lost your spouse, you are on a grief journey from that point forward. 
What you need to remember after you deeply grieve the loss of your spouse, you've got to remember at some point that you have come to a fork in the road. Let this fork lay somewhere in your house where every day you will see it. It could be on the counter in the kitchen. It could be at your nightstand. It could be where you sit and watch television. When you see this fork, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about decisions. When you pick up a fork, what have you decided to do? Eat. Now, with that fork in your hand, what other decisions are you making? What you're going to eat, okay? What else are you deciding about with that fork in your hand? When you're going to eat. What else are you deciding? How much you're going to eat. See, what you're doing when you pick up that fork is you are in the process of making decisions. At some point in time, after you've lost your spouse, you've got to realize I've got to start making some decisions about the rest of my life because I didn't die. Somebody I loved dearly died, but I did not die. So you've got to start making some decisions about the rest of your life. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? Some of us remember, I'm sure, Helen Keller and her challenging life. She made this observation, when one door of happiness closes, another opens, but often we look so long at the closed door, we do not see the one that has been opened for us. Whenever we've lost a spouse, a door has been slammed shut in our life. It has not only been slammed shut, it has been locked. And when we've lost a beloved spouse, all we can do is in disbelief stare at that slam shut locked door. I can't believe this has happened. That's deep grief. I don't know how long that a person is going to spend in deep grief. I hope they're going to spend as much time as they need to. But at some point in time, what we've got to decide is, Can I find another door of opportunity to walk through to make a life for myself after this loss? When my wife died on bended knee at my bedside, I prayed frequently for three things. Number one, that God would open a door of opportunity for me. Number two, that God would give me the vision to see the open door. Sometimes God opens doors of opportunity for us, but we're so preoccupied and our thinker and our feeler is running ran, random all over the place. We don't see the open doors that he opens. So I pray God open a door of opportunity for me to continue to serve you some way, somehow. Lord, give me the vision to see the open door. And then three, Lord, give me the courage to walk through that open door. That prayer is what led me to Murray City, Tennessee, population 650, a little church of about 50 or so that was brokenhearted because of what they'd experienced. I was 61 years old at that point. I didn't have a wife. I was a Yankee. How in the world was I going to find a job in the southeast part of the country? <laughs> that little church took me in. For five years, we worked together, and we developed a great local widowhood ministry there. It was a perfect match. God did open the door of opportunity. I did finally see it, and I did walk through it. It's different for different people, but we need to realize that we still have a life. There may be times when we don't feel like we want to live it, but we still have a life, and we need to use that life to glorify God. In some way, somehow, we need to start making some choices that honor him in our life. What am I going to do? Well, in regard to you and your marital status, you are released or free. Now, you may not feel like that, but you are released or free. Your feelings are not always consistent with reality. Many widowed people even continue to wear their wedding ring for years, and in some cases, for the rest of their life. If you want to know what happened with me, in the book, After the End Comes, there's a chapter in this book 
about rings after the end comes. And I tell the anecdote, the story, of when I finally took my wedding ring off. But it was five years after my wife passed away. And it was in a rather unusual setting. I'll leave that teaser for you to look at the book. <laughs> I had, had Miss Carolyn at the Murray City Church ask me, Dean, do you still feel married? Miss Carolyn had lost her husband. He had fallen out of a bucket that was high and lifted up in an industrial accident. He fell out of that bucket and died. She said, I still feel married. She said, Dean, do you still feel married? I said, no, Carolyn, I don't still feel married. But I was still wearing my wedding ring at that time. I said, well, Miss Carolyn, I've been wearing this ring since I was 19 years old. It's like it's become a part of me. Sometimes you can feel something that's not really reality. You're released or free as far as God's perspective is concerned. You also have some unique characteristics about your life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul describes a person who's unmarried as without care, cares for the things of the Lord, pleasing to the Lord without distraction. Now, he's not bad-mouthing marriage here. This is the same man who, by the inspiration of God, wrote that beautiful passage in Ephesians chapter 5 about husbands loving wives and then wives respecting husbands. He's simply pointing out in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you don't have a mate, then you don't have the responsibilities that go with having a mate. And so there are some freedoms and some flexibilities you now have that you didn't have before. What are you going to do with those if you no longer have those responsibilities? All that time and effort that you poured into that relationship, what are you going to do with it? Well, now you're more available than you've ever been before. You're more flexible than you've ever been before. And you have experience that you didn't want, but you're stuck with. And the experience is loss. If I had been married, I would have never gone to Murray City, Tennessee. And I'll tell you why. When we're married, we need to develop consensus and make decisions that dictate how we live in our marriage. My wife would have never agreed to go on to Murray City, Tennessee. Now, it wasn't because the population was 650. It was because she would have had to travel 30 minutes to go to the nearest Walmart. <laughs> My wife loved to shop. She wasn't a big buyer, but she loved to shop. I thought it was crazy. I used to have more mileage on my pedometer than any male on planet Earth. Somebody has probably passed me up since she passed away. I used to think that a good place for me to be buried was the Walmart in North Canton, Ohio, because she would have come to visit me at least twice a month because of that. But, see, now I didn't have a wife, so I didn't have to ask her, Honey, would you like to move there? I just decided to move there. And it was because of that particular decision that a lot of wonderful things occurred. But I had to spend a lot of time, about a year and a half, staring at a slammed shut locked door that I hated. Sometimes there are things in your life that really you do just hate to have to deal with. Widowhood is not just a time of grief. It's a time of transition. It's a time of adjustment. It's also a time of opportunity because, yes, a door has been closed because of your loss. But are there other doors of opportunity? What you need to be thinking about is a new normal, a new beginning. What do you want to do with the rest of your life now? And then you have to work toward it. For different people, it's going to be a different new normal or a new beginning. But our future can be what we decide to make it by the grace of God, with the help of God. For me, it was the Widowhood Workshop Ministry and my family's passion project. You know, a lot of times when, when we're married, our ministries are complementary, the husband and the wife. My wife, she answered many a call. She typed many things for me. She helped me in my ministry as a local preacher. 
She was a crater wool teacher. I can't tell you the hundreds of things that I cut out, those colorful things that we laminated for those little babies and those little kids to see. We taught classes together, the two and three year olds and the four and fives on Wednesday night. There were things I learned about their parents I didn't want to know on Wednesday night through those classes that we taught together. But she's no longer there. And so now I have to decide what am I going to do. After we've lost our spouse, we're not dead. We're still alive. We need to find a meaningful purpose for our life. It needs to be something maybe that you've never done before. And you may need to participate in a lot of trial and error trying to find some place for you to serve. God didn't save us to sit on a church pew on Sunday. He saved us to serve. And we need to find a niche where we can serve. And you know one of the best places for withered people to serve? Is with other withered people. Other people who've experienced grief. If this church were ever to start a local widowhood ministry, you know who ought to be serving in that widowhood ministry? More than anybody else. Other widowed people. Because you have something in common. Now, agreed, not something you wanted, but you have something in common with other people. That causes you to assimilate with them really easily. You can relate to them really easily. Imagine about this room. If it were just only withered people. That would be the only public environment in which those withered people would be where they would not be social misfits. Because everybody there has also gone through great loss. See, the church can create these atmospheres that can be very warm and very welcoming to people who have gone through a terrible loss, the loss of their spouse. And when we do that as an outreach, into the community. A community that has way over 3,000 widowed people in it, like Warner Robins, Georgia, males and females. Imagine the outreach that that could be. The people whose families may not be ministering to them because their families don't know what they're going through. But now everybody in this room does know a little bit about what it's like to try to embrace life after loss. I want to thank you for your attention uh, this morning. I want to thank you for coming, especially if you came last night uh, and this morning. I want to give something away. Now, I want to give this away to somebody who knows Daniel. You know, preacher Daniel. Now, I want to know in this room, who's known Daniel longer than anybody else? Now, his relatives don't count, okay? Okay, somebody who's not a relative. How many of you knew Daniel Prior to his coming here, how many of you knew him? None of you? You hired a total stranger to fill the pulpit? Okay, I'm going to have to go with this a different route then. How many of you knew his wife before he came here? Katrina, is that right? Okay. You, you brought a guy in here, and you didn't know him, and you didn't know his wife. But it still worked out? Okay. How, how long, uh, Daniel, how long have you been married? 24 years. He had to, he, his eyes kind of, he had to do the math real quick. Okay. 24 years, almost a quarter of, of a century. Okay. Uh, I have this uh, book here that Daniel helped. To make. I did too, but Daniel contributed something to this book that was really uh, special. Uh, I, I first became acquainted with Daniel in 2018 in Lakeland, Florida at the Florida School of Preaching lectureship. There was a lectureship that year and it was themed, Do You Understand the Biblical View of the Home? And Daniel has some great stuff in this book. He did an awesome job that year in dealing with a very complex subject. He dealt with the subject of polygamy in the Bible. And he did an awesome job. This is really a great book in regard to the home. 
Now, I wanted to give it away to somebody because I have several copies of this same book. So here's what I want to do. I want to uh, ask you, uh, how long have you been married? If you're presently married, how long have you been married? Who's been married the longest of anybody who's here? How many? And you're still married? You're still married, 67 years. Anybody else? Can anybody beat 67? Whoo, that's, I bet you've got some stories to tell. <laughs> now, have you got your husband fixed yet, or is he still a work in progress? Okay. <laughs> okay, well, something that might help you or your family, I'm going to give you this book, and you can keep this book or you can give it to somebody in your family. Pardon me? Oh, okay. If the library does not have it, yeah. He does. Oh, that, really, that's neat. Well, what a neat story that you have to tell. Yeah, thank you very much for coming here this morning. Okay, I have one other thing I want to uh, give away uh, before we uh, finish up. Who here uh, has been uh, widowed most recently? Widowed most recently. How long? Three months. Anybody else widowed less than three months? Uh, this book, I want to give you this book. This is a very uh, touching, thoughtful book. It's uh, called A Grace Disguised. And in this book, there is a story of, about somebody who suffered great loss. And it really is a very, very well-written book. Very much faith-based, and maybe you could benefit from this book. Mm -hmm. Consider that a gift from my family, the Widowhood Workshop Ministry. It's our family's passion project. Let me mention before we close about the display up here, and then also the display about the ministry itself. And if you can be um, of help to the ministry, I would really appreciate your prayers. If you're on Facebook... Uh, we have a public Facebook page. Three words, Widowhood Workshop Ministry. That's the public Facebook page. If you would like and follow that, it could be helpful to us. You can share things off of that, maybe on your uh, Facebook feed, Widowhood Workshop Ministry. We also have a uh, website. It's widowhoodworkshop.com. If you could share that, you could visit uh, there occasionally. If you'd share that with other folks as well, maybe we can be of help uh, to some other folks. One of the things that we recently did was we uh, created these large magnets that people can put on their car. Uh, you're welcome to take one of these. These are free. Uh, my son-in-law had these made. Uh, he, uh, when he picked them up, he put one on the back of his car, and he stopped at a store. And when he walked away from the car, he noticed a woman who came up and took a picture of this. It has the website on it. It's another way that we're trying to outreach to the community. You know, one of the best ways to introduce people to Jesus and his church is to do that when they're hurting, when they're struggling, when they have questions or concerns about themselves or other people. And so we have these. If you'd have any interest in taking one of these and putting it on your car, feel free to take uh, one of these. You can visit Bucky up here. Bucky has uh, some special treats for you. If you'd like to have uh, some candy, feel free to come up and visit Bucky. And if you want this to be a moving experience, remember about the individually wrapped prunes that Bucky also has. And you can come and take a part in his individually wrapped prunes. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Could we go ahead and pray? Dave, uh, could you take over and do whatever you think would be appropriate? Tomorrow morning we're going to be talking about praise the Lord no matter what in Bible study. And then we're also, during the sermon time, going to be studying from Psalm 31, what we ought to do when we're overwhelmed. Both of those very biblical, very practical lessons. Uh, we want to say uh, thank you to our brother Dean for just uh, an amazing uh, journey uh, to understand the struggles that people deal with. And we're grateful for that. We're hopeful and prayerful that we can expand on that and continue in that work. We invite you tomorrow. Uh, as he mentioned, as the uh, study continues, as the lesson continues, and, 
and more great information and lessons for us to take into our hearts and to live and to help others to get through this difficult life. We live in a fallen world and we are here to help one another uh, to travel through this fallen world to bring it, it, all of us home to heaven. Uh, we are having a, a meal that uh, I think is already prepared that we bring out in a moment. So if you give them a moment to set that up, you're certainly welcome to uh, stay, talk to Dean, come and look at some of the material. Uh, and uh, if we could be of any service and help, we'll be glad to do that. Any other announcements I need to make, uh, Steve? Steve uh, reminds us that uh, we uh, could continue our, our study tomorrow on uh, widowhood and uh, issues associated with that. Our uh, study will begin at 9 o'clock at our uh, Bible class hour, our worship at 10 o'clock, and then uh, Brother Dean will be uh, speaking again at 5. Tomorrow morning we'll be upstairs in the auditorium, uh, but in the evening we'll come back here uh, in the fellowship room at 5 o'clock. So, anything else? All right, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the day, the every day that you've given us on this earth, and we pray that we use each and every day to your glory. We're thankful, Father, for the opportunity to have gathered together to, to hear a portion of your word and to understand more of the struggles of those who are dealing with uh, loss of various kinds. We're thankful for our brother Dean and his, his passion uh, to serve you and his compassion for others. We pray your blessings upon he and his ministry. Father, we pray that we'd be a blessing to others as we come to know uh, their struggles, that we be your vessels of uh, support and, and need in their time of troubles. We're thankful, Father, for all the hearts and souls that are present and those that could not be here. Pray, Father, we'd be able to reach them with your word. Father, we're mindful of the uh, struggles that we all have. We pray your blessings upon us. Pray you be with us every single day. We're thankful for your son, for his blood that was shed, that we can have a right relationship with you. Father, we give you great, uh, give you honor and glory in all things. And we're mindful, Father, of those, the food that's been prepared for us and we're about to partake of. We pray your blessings upon all the hands that prepared it. And Father, we pray that we take it to nourishment of our bodies and the glory to you in all things, we pray in Jesus' name.